I Watched Her Life by Grand Moff Pony. So you want to know my story too, huh? How everything has impacted me? Don't get me wrong, I'm glad you thought of me and all, but surely there's more important ponies to talk to besides me, right? Oh, I guess I did see her more often than most. This is... was... her favorite eatery in the entire city. Now, there's a bond between the customers and myself, especially the regulars. It's a pact of silence, really. They got tales to tell, and I've got ears to listen. Only difference between me and the bar stallion is I'm slinging coffee instead of booze. Eh, but you know what? Maybe this is the one time I can waive that rule. Much has been said about her, most of it vile and disgusting. Nearly all of it either outright lies or ludicrous rumor. Even now, I grit my teeth until they hurt every time I hear some pony in here drag her through the mud. Even all these years later, it was never fair to her. Not then, not now, not ever. Her story, or I should say my story about her, needs to be told. She deserves at least that much from me, after all. So, belly up to the bar and get out an extra quill while I pour some French roast. Oh, what'll it be? I got plain cake and chocolate frosted with sprinkles. Those were her favorites, you know. All settled? Good. So, Princess Twilight Sparkle. I still remember the first time I saw her. Heck, I remember it like it was yesterday. After all, how could I forget such a cute little foal? Especially after she detonated my coffee machine, trying to refill her dad's mug. Yeah, her dad had stopped in, as he usually did every Friday morning. It was bring your foal to work day, so Nightlight had an extra guest with him when he came in. Cutest little foal I ever seen, too. Those eyes could have melted a Wendigo's frozen heart. Anyway, I guess Nightlight had polished off his first cup of coffee before I could get back to him, and little Twilight must have gotten it in her head to just take care of it herself. I saw a coffee mug hover past me out of the corner of my eye, but I was too busy levitating a tray of eclairs into the case to turn around. I heard the coffee machine word of life, and the next thing I knew, half the cafe was getting a free wake-up call in the form of a coffee shower. She sat there in shock, as if she had just blown up the world. Until she saw her dad's mane dripping with coffee, of course. Then she nearly rolled off her booster seat in a fit of laughter. Celestia blessed Nightlight's heart. He took it all in stride. He had way more patience than I ever did. Maybe that's why I never had foals of my own. Or maybe it was my ex-wife. Anyway, moving on. I was pretty good friends with Nightlight. And his wife, too. They were some of my first regulars when I got the shop from my parents and reopened it. Nightlight and I would chat often and occasionally go out for a cider or two when Velvet was having a book club over at the house. But I was still a bit shocked when Nightlight asked me to watch over his daughter for a bit between school dismissal and the end of his shift at the observatory. I had no idea how to handle a foal when I was alone, much less in the middle of a running cafe. But old Nighty assured me she wouldn't be any trouble, especially not to my coffee machines. And was he ever right on that? She'd come in every day after school with a smile on her face, and saddlebags full to the brim with books and notes. If things were slow, she'd tell me all about her day, sometimes in excruciating detail. Who knew a little one could talk so much? But after a while, she'd make her way to the counter, open a book or two, and that was the last I'd hear from her most days. She'd read and read and read some more. And if she wasn't reading, she was scribbling notes on her parchments, faster than I thought was possible. After a while, I had to coax her into switching to one of the booths, as her books were spreading out to cover nearly the entire counter. In exchange, though, I had to promise never to run out of hot chocolate while she was there. I figured it was a fair trait, especially if I could avoid being subjected to her pretty please stare again. That thing had a magic all its own, I swear. That good, huh? Yeah? See, I told you they were the best donuts in Candlelot. Need a top-off, by the way? Sure, coming right up. Now, where was I? Oh, uh, yeah. When Nighty and Velvet came by to tell me that Twilight had been accepted to Princess Celestia's school for gifted unicorns, I have to admit I was mildly surprised. To think that she'd graduated from exploding my coffee pots to Princess Celestia's own student had me reeling. I had to admit, though, I felt a little bit of pride for that bright-eyed young filly, too. I figured I'd hardly see her anymore, now that she was essentially living at the castle. But as it turned out, I saw her even more. 
The cafe is barely a ten minute walk from the castle gates, so she'd stop by nearly every day after her lessons were complete. She'd grab the corner booth, and just like before, she'd crack open her books and keep working. Sometimes I had to threaten to cut off the hot chocolate, unless she took a break now and again. The breaks were good too, and not just for Twilight's always on mind. It gave me a chance to talk to her, to get to know her as she continued to explore new spells and branches of knowledge. It was then that I began to see the true genius that was locked inside of her. In my mind, these old, overly painted walls played host to a unicorn with more knowledge, more talent, and more insight than I had ever seen in any pony, save the princesses themselves. I know how much of a struggle it can be for we unicorns to use magic effectively, even for small tasks, but as Twilight told me all of the spells and constructs she was mastering, I couldn't help but be awestruck. Spell forms that normally required years to master, she had perfected in a few months. I knew then that whatever her calling was in life, magic would be at the very heart of it all. The years went by in the blur after that point. To say that Twilight was another one of my regulars would be doing her a disservice. She wasn't just a regular, she was a part of my daily existence. No offense to Shining Armor, of course, but I felt like a big brother watching his baby sister grow up in front of him, one afternoon at a time. While I poured coffee and slung dough around the kitchen, one of the greatest minds in the Questeria was formed in that corner booth, surrounded by a stack of books, a bottomless mug of hot chocolate, and a plate of donuts, with sprinkles, of course. When she told me that the princess was sending her to Ponyville to supervise that year's summer sun celebration, I couldn't have been more proud of her. Needless to say, I was shocked to see her so grumpy about it. Normally, Twilight had an answer for everything, and if she didn't, she'd work non-stop until she found it. But this time, she was facing a problem that wasn't in a book, and she had no idea what to do. When she came in here late one evening, right before close, she looked about as lost as a tourist without a map. She slumped into her usual booth and did something I had never seen from her before. She asked for help. She asked for help, and that's when I made a split-second decision. I poured her coffee instead of hot chocolate. She never asked why I did it, but I'll tell you why. I did it because in that moment... I saw her begin the transformation from Philly to Mare. She was facing a problem that took heart and mind to solve, and she was willing to ask for help instead of relying on her pride. I passed the mug to her as I sat down, and we talked for over an hour. She rambled and ranted and even cried. But in the end, I helped her make sense of what she was facing, or why the princess had trusted such a seemingly mundane task to her. Or at least I'd like to think that I did, my own lack of wisdom notwithstanding. When Twilight left that night, she was still a bit uneasy about leaving her studies and a comfortable environment behind the planet festival, but at least she had a better appreciation from what she might get from it, along with the beginnings of a wicked addiction to coffee. Besides the construction workers and the guards I see in here, to this day she's the only other pony I've seen take the coffee straight up, no sugar or nothing. Oh, looks like a customer. Ah, it's Plum Lion. Must be five o'clock then. Excuse me one moment. Hey, Plum. Your usual? Okay, sorry about that. You still nursing that coffee, or would you like some more? Oh, another donut then. Ha! And Joe claims yet another convert. Be right back. All right, now where were we? Uh, oh, right, the summer sun celebration. Well, I think we all know how that turned out, so no need to rehash that. Point is, after that, everything changed for Twilight. She came back to Candlelot afterwards, but it was only for a few days. She said that the five mares she met in Ponyville were chosen along with her to bear the elements of harmony, and that it was really they who rescued Princess Luna from the nightmare. Not only that, but Princess Celestia had granted her a new home in Ponyville to continue her studies in magic and friendship. I was sad to see her go, of course, but I was so happy for her, too. She was a grown mare now, with a home of her own, a day job, and the boundless ability to succeed. I got together with her folks and we threw her a little going-away party at the cafe the night before she left. We danced, we sang, reminisced, and carried on well into the night. Of course, a platter full of her favorite chocolate frosted self, too. Naturally, I didn't see her too often after that, as she lived in Ponyville and all. But when she did come back home, whether to see her folks or meet with the princesses, she always stopped by to say hello. She brought her friends with her a few times, too, and let me tell you, she couldn't have found better friends if she had written an equation for finding the perfect friend. Well, wait, on second thought, she probably did, didn't she? Anyway, her friends are great. To this day, no pony has even come close to Rainbow's feet of ten Ursa Claws in one sitting either. On occasion, she even brought the princesses with her for a snack. 
I never been so intimidated in my life as when both princesses walked in here at the same time to place an order. Passing them a couple of donuts felt like I was submitting my soul to final judgment or something. Thank the stars they liked them, though. I know Princess Luna loved them in particular, as she's made a number of clandestine runs here right at closing time for a box of donut holes. But you didn't hear that from me, got it? Anyway, as the years went by, the adventures and the achievements just kept piling up for Twilight. That pony got herself into more far-flung adventures than daring do. Yet each time, her and her friends would find a way. And every time, when she'd come back to Candlelight to share her adventures with her family, she'd stop by. Same corner booth, same cup of coffee, same chocolate frosted donut. It was like she never left at all. And never once did I hear her take more than a shred of credit for any of it. She talked for hours about all that her friends had accomplished, or what she had learned about friendship and magic, but she'd hardly ever take any credit for it. Sure, she was proud, but she never boasted. At least not to me. Oh, pony feathers, that's the oven. Can't let those crullers overbake for even a moment, or the edges get crispier than hay fries. Hold that thought. Phew, got to them in time. Those are the most sensitive donuts I make, but they sell well, so I can't complain. Well, I could, but it never helps. If it did, I'd still be married. More coffee? That's more like it. Coming up. I'm sure I've rambled your ears off by now, but I promise I'm almost done. Besides, the after-dinner rush will be here soon, and they won't be happy to find empty trays. So I made the habit of keeping up with the goings-on in Ponyville, through conversations with guards during breaks, or with Nighty when he'd make his usual Friday stop-in. It kept me partially in the loop on Twilight and her adventures, but nothing could have prepared me for the day that Nighty walked in and showed me the day's paper. A new princess is born. I'll never forget the headline as long as I live, and right beneath it, a picture of Twilight Sparkle, with wings on her back and the crown on her head. I even kept an extra copy and framed the front page. I remember sitting in the front section at a coronation. No pony else noticed me, of course, but that's okay. I'm just a donut hawker, after all. But to be there with Twilight's closest friends and family was the greatest honor of my life. It was the first coronation since that of Princess Cadence, so for most ponies, it was the first one they'd ever seen in the flesh. <laughs> and what a party it was afterwards. Music, dancing, food, and cider till daybreak. Ambassadors came from all over the world. And at that point, even jaded old me could feel the magic of friendship humming through the air. If the world had ended at that very moment, at least it would have ended with a smile on its face. Because what happened after that was nothing short of evil. The party had barely been swept up when the rumors started to percolate. I'd hear them occasionally myself. Whispers and hushed conversations in these very booths, at this very bar. They thought I couldn't hear them. Or maybe they didn't care. But I heard them. They doubted Twilight. Who she was, what she had achieved, even where she had come from. They, who only weeks earlier had sung her praises and pledged their loyalty to her, now sat feet away from me, selling everything that she stood for, everything that I knew she believed in. And it only got worse when Twilight unveiled her proposals to modernize Equestria and open lines of communications to nations both known and unknown. The whispers turned into shouts, then the yells, then the screams of rage and defiance. It was maddening. Twilight was trying to bring us into the future, not destroy us. I seethed behind this counter. I desperately wanted to rip their throats out, to dump scalding coffee all over them, to throw them out the bucking window. Yet all I could muster was a soft word here or there, to try and dissuade them without alienating them. What else could I do? Report them? These were nobility for Celestia's sake. Reporting them would do no good. I simply held my tongue and prayed that this would all pass away like some grotesque fad. Damn me to Tartarus, I should have done more. I should have... Oh, damn it all. Oh, gosh. I'm sorry. I guess I kind of lost it there. My apologies. <clears throat> it was painful to watch, and even more painful to hear about, because Twilight would begin returning to her booth nearly every night. Everything was the same, except for Twilight. I had never seen her more shaken in her resolve or weakened in her confidence that she could succeed. Some nights she would just cry endlessly, watering her coffee down with her tears. 
She'd send messages ahead of her on particularly bad days, and I'd close the shop early to give her more time to talk. Funny how that one oven keeps going down on me, you know? When she'd tell me about her plans, the light in her eyes, the enthusiasm in her voice, would roar back to life. After a bit of prodding on my part, after a bit of prodding on my part, she even opened up about a particular god that she had become, shall we say, close friends with. Whoever that god was, he was one lucky stallion, I'll say that. She was in love head over hooves, that's for sure. But then, she'd tell me about the latest rumors spread about her. Well, it was vile language that was thrown into her face in open court. I just couldn't believe that ponies could be so cruel, so heartless. And to one of the rulers, too. It broke my heart to see Twilight like that. Not like the strong princess that she was, but the scared little foal that blew up a coffee pot and had no idea what to do next. The last time I saw her, to my eternal torture, I'll never forget that either. It was a Saturday night, three days before, before she was murdered. She came in about thirty minutes before close. I still had a hoof full of customers, but she just went to her booth and waited in utter silence. You know, she wasn't even safe from those monsters in here. Right as the last customer was leaving, a couple of hotshot nobles must have seen her through the windows as they passed by. Because they started knocking on the windows, yelling things at her that would make any mother cringe in disgust. One of them even had the nerve to trot in here and throw curse after curse at her, with no regard for any pony else around. I half expected Twilight to finally snap and banished this plot hole to the moon. But she just sat there and took it, her eyes locked on the table in front of her, until the louse was out of breath. Then she raised her eyes, and with the same soft voice she always had, invited him to sit with her and hear the truth. That pitiful excuse for a pony simply spat on the ground and stormed out. I locked the door and shut the blinds as fast as I could, but when I turned around, I saw that poor mare in a state of pure shock. She didn't move, and she was barely breathing, it seemed. Her eyes seemed devoid of spirit, of life, of energy. As if a part of her had died in that very moment. I ran over and held her as tight as I could, and waited for the tears to come. And come they did, more than I had ever seen a pony cry. We didn't say much after that. I just held on to her as tightly as I could, and let the tears run dry. When she left that night, she turned back right before she walked out the door, ran back, and hugged me like I was a second brother. She looked me in the eye, pretty easy to do at her height now, and told me thank you for being there for her. I looked right back at her and put on my best big brother smile, and I told her, I, uh, oh gosh, this is tougher than I thought. I told her that I was proud of her, just like her parents and her brother, and I did what any good friend would do for another pony. And, and I told her to never stop believing that there is good inside of every creature, no matter who they are or what they had done, that when trouble times arise, to look for the light and gallop towards it, and when she gets it, to turn around and shine it out, so no pony has to live in the dark. She gave me another hug, and for a moment I saw that same happy smile that crossed her lips a million times before, and then she walked out the door. The morning that they discovered her body, I was just opening my doors for the day, when Celestia's screams of agony ripped through the air like a banshee. Somehow I knew. In some deep, dark corner of my soul, I felt my heart shatter into a million pieces. I knew what had happened. I knew Equestria had lost a princess, a family had lost a daughter, a brother had lost a sister. Five special mares had lost their centerpiece, and I had lost my hope for the future. At least, the last thing I remember of her was a smile. Perhaps that's my silver lining, if that's the right term. But those screams, those cries of utter sorrow that echoed through this city, those screams will haunt me for the rest of my days. So... There you go. That's my story of Twilight Sparkle. Not the princess, but the pony behind the crown. The pony I watched grow up before my eyes and change the fate of Equestria. An extremely talented young mare that gave her all for the whole world, only to have it thrown back in her face. May she rest in peace, as far away from this wretched place as possible. 
As for me, I'm not sure what I'll do or where I'll go. But I'm not staying here any longer. I just, I just can't. My family has been operating some kind of store in this city for generations, from produce stands to smithies to this very cafe. And believe me, the business has been good to me over the years. But I can't stand to see any of these ponies anymore. Sure, most ponies' opinions changed after Twilight died, and to an outsider, things might even look somewhat normal again. It's anything but normal, though, and this farce that passes for normal now only makes my blood boil. Do these hypocrites really think they're fooling any pony? Or are they just that shallow? I saw them tear poor Twilight apart at every turn, yet all she wanted to do was usher this nation into a brighter future. Only after Twilight had been murdered in cold blood did they suddenly change their tune. Now it was a national tragedy, and all those common ponies that gleefully jeered and mocked Twilight scattered like leaves in the wind when their perverted wishes actually became reality. What's more, most of the nobles that goaded the crowds to turn against one of their princesses had the gall to attend the state funeral. They were all dressed in black and full of every vapid platitude that they could spit out of their mouths. Even the grave could not shield Twilight from their venomous words. The whole thing sickened me. It still sickens me, to be honest. Some days I barely resist the urge to throw coffee in the faces when they come in here, acting like they were never involved. Twilight's killers may have already met their fate at the gallows, but the real instigators, and the hypocrites who blindly follow them, still roam free. I see them everywhere. In the streets, in these booths, at this bar. I wish... I wish I could throw them in the gallows myself. Even the ponies that supported her, and there were many of them, mind you, aren't the same. You can see it in their eyes. It's as if they're living in a world that's no longer their own. Nighty and Velvet only come in occasionally now, and when they do, it's like meeting strangers all over again. They always cover themselves in long cloaks and clutch little mystic sparkle to their sides, as if she could disappear at any moment. I try to get them to talk, to say anything, but they just get a to-go order and shuffle off without hardly a word between them. Sometimes I wonder if they're even the same ponies anymore. Shining Armor? The last time I saw Shining was about three weeks after the funeral, when he came in here for a snack. I had just brought him a fresh coffee when two nobles walked in. They didn't say anything at first, but as they walked behind Shining, they very loudly cracked a sick joke about Twilight's relationship with that other god pony. Before I could even process what I had heard, Shining had punched them both in the face and bucked them straight through the front windows. I told him it was all right, and frankly, those two plot holes deserved a lot more than they got. But he just hung his head and walked off. His train returned to the Crystal Empire a few days later, and I haven't seen him since. Despite all that, what hurts me the most is right in front of me all day, every day. It's been three years. My heart still aches every time I look over at that corner booth. I try to tell myself that I get used to it. Yet nearly every afternoon, I glance at that booth at around 3.30, expecting Twilight to be sitting there like she always was, surrounded by a pile of books, a plate of chocolate frosteds and a pot of coffee. She's never there, of course. I stare at that empty booth each day, and every time I do, I feel another piece of my soul wither away. Winter's nearly here, but come next spring, I'm packing my stuff and leaving. I don't know where I'll go, and I'll miss the heck out of this cafe, but I'm leaving. I hope my family will forgive me for abandoning our roots, but I'm willing to live with it, even if they don't. They might choose to stick it out, try to make the best of it, but me? I just can't do it. I'm not that strong. Heaven knows that I tried. I've been trying for the last three years. It's just too much. So many callous hypocrites, so many empty hearts, so many broken souls. I spend half the day holding back my rage, and the other half holding back my tears, while well, I become less of a pony and more of an empty shell. Huh. Now that I think about it, I've done a miserable job of following my own advice. But really, I just can't. I told Twilight to always find the good in everything, to find the light, grab it, and shine it out into the darkness. Well, I tried. But there's no light left here. At least not for any pony with a soul left in the body. Not all that's left of the light is its shadow. 
Perhaps in time, the light will reemerge over us, and the sun will truly shine once again. Yet the shadow over that corner booth will remain, now and forever. That shadow can never be pierced, not even by the sun. He moved from place to place, never staying in one city too long. The empty donut would keep searching, searching for a light to end his darkness. That was I Watched Her Life by Grand Moff Pony. Music by Chris Zabriskie. And read by me, Narrator Pony. Until next time, stay brony, my friends.